So there were a couple of anecdotes which happened in late 2010. What were they? Well, one was back, you know, like I'd gone back to India, uh, as I frequently do for one of my visits, and I was invited to one of these fancy parties on the fringes of Delhi, like they call these farmhouse parties. Like the farmers of Delhi have long left, but these farmhouses, because they got these landed concession rates still exist out there for, you know, for, uh, for many of the rich to have their fancy sort of homes out there, these sprawling mansions, which have all sorts of fancy features, you know, uh, and the one that I went to for this party in late 2010 had a railroad running around it. Uh, as part of the extravagance, and and you enter there, and the and you get chefs from all over the world, which are sort of you know, preparing the food, and it's a complete you know like atmosphere of decadence. So here I was at this party in late 2010, and I got into a conversation with this young 25 year old. He was a typical Delhi type, you know, wearing a tight black T-shirt, hair spiked, gelled, and he was the son of you know what they call in Delhi to be like an exporter, you know, like you know like a guy who's making uh, uh, some money on the quick. And so like this guy, you know, like had only sort of worked with his dad, 25, he sort of chats with me for a bit and then susses me out and very quickly sort of, you know, figures out that I'm like a global investor who's back in India looking for opportunities, or at least that's what he wants to believe in. And he goes to me, you know, shrugs his shoulder and goes, where else will the money go? You know, and such overconfidence that, you know, that, 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 that the West is in decline, the money's got to come here. Where else is it going to go? And, and he was parroting to me not, not only what was his belief, but what I think a lot of us came to believe that, you know, like in this myth that the West is in decline and the money is bound to flow to these, you know, like places. And that's where it's got to go. This, along with another anecdote that happened to me back in Moscow shortly thereafter, really sowed the seeds for this book and this idea uh, about, you know, about the coming decade. The other anecdote which uh, is that I went to Moscow. Uh, there was a conference being organized out there. Um, and the um, uh, Prime Minister then, Putin, wanted somebody to present to him at the conference about the state of affairs in, in Russia. And then so the conference organizers and, and Putin's office asked me whether I'd make that presentation. I said, fine, I'll do it. So, I mean, there I was making this presentation to Putin, and I did not know this was going to be such a big deal because although I'd met him before, but I mean, here the, like it was being televised, the cameras were on and stuff like that at this conference, and I was presenting like to Putin. And I gave a pretty blunt assessment about Russia, about how I was optimistic on Russia a decade ago when things were completely chaotic and values were cheap in Russia and people hated it. And now a decade later, the per capita income of Russia was $12,000. And, and that Russia basically was regressing rather than progressing, uh, that you know, just being reliant on oil and ga gas is not enough. A rich country makes rich goods. If Russia wants to get rich, it better you know, get some sort of a manufacturing sector going or some you know, like new, new businesses going, and it kind of such a poor track record of doing what it is. So from an investor, it was a pretty blunt assessment of how Russia was doing. And, and you know, Putin was, of course, being very courteous. He and I were on the stage. He was there taking notes down as if he was actually listening and stuff. But the next day, I, I found out you know, what exactly this was all about because the entire Russian media went after me. You know, uh, a lot of it is obviously state controlled. And their sort of take was that, you know, like, who needs your money? You know, that uh, this was the peak of the boom in 2010 that, you know, like, you know, uh, like hell with all your advice, who really needs your money? And, and this sort of also showed me how the attitude had changed as far as Russia was concerned, a country that I'd, I'd visited uh, uh, um, quite frequently over the years. And uh, right thereafter, there was a client conference that we had organized for our clients. And in that client conference, uh, uh, we had called the former president, George Bush, to be the guest speaker. And I was having a fireside chat with him in that format, like an interview for the audience. So I asked him that, you know, what are you, uh, that, that what is it that you saw in Putin? You know, uh, uh, where he commented so sort of famously like a decade ago that, that you, you know, like you looked him in the eye and you saw a friend. I said, what is it that you saw him and do you still hold that belief? And he also told me something which sort of mirrored uh, um, my own sort of change in, uh, in Russia. And uh, like he said how the attitude of Putin had changed. He was saying that when Putin would first come to uh, the White House uh, back in the early 2000s, Putin would talk about his debt, and how he's paying down his debt and, and what all he is doing and stuff. And, he's, and he says that he remembers in like one of those visits, uh, uh, Bush introduced him to his dog, uh, uh, Barney or whatever. And so, you know, you know, Putin looked at it, you know, didn't really react much to it. 
He says that at the, at the peak of the boom in 2007 or so, he went to Moscow and Putin to, took him to his uh, dacha. And by then, you know, Putin's confidence was huge. He was really believing that, that, that you know, Russia had truly re-emerged because of the massive boom that uh, Russia had enjoyed. And so he said that, he, uh, that, that uh, you know, like uh, Putin's questions then were much more about needling Bush about the mortgage-backed securities and other debt, et cetera, which, which the U.S. Uh, had. And then like, out of the blue, you know, like Putin goes to Bush, that do you want to meet my dog? So like Bush says, okay, I, you know, let's meet your dog. So like out comes, you know, like Putin's dog, this big dog, and sort of, you know, Putin says to Bush, referring to his older meeting, see, bigger, better, stronger. Right, so this was the massive change in attitude which had taken place as far as this is concerned. Now, all this to me was telling me about how seriously the attitudes had changed in emerging markets. That when, that a, a decade ago, when we had to sell emerging markets, nobody was willing to listen to us when valuations were really cheap, and 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 the whole you know sort of uh, place appeared to be a real mess. And now, all of a sudden, a decade later any sort of country with an emerging market tag had a lot of hype around it. So that's when I decided I'm going to write this book. And the idea of the book really was that, uh, is that if you look at economic history, you've got to sort of distinguish. Emerging markets are now nearly 40% of the global economy. You cannot treat them as a homogeneous entity. Uh, the uh, differences are incredible. You've got countries in Africa with a per capita income of less than $1,000, you got large economies like India with a per capita income of $1,500. Then you got the likes of Korea with a per capita income of $20,000 plus. In the middle, you got a whole bunch of countries like Brazil, Mexico, Turkey, Russia with a per capita income of ten dollars to $12,000. And even China, things have changed uh, dramatically. The China's per capita income level now is around $6,000. And if you look at economic history, typically when countries get to that sort of per capita income level, you have to adjust for like obviously exchange rate uh, valuations, growth tends to slow down. That in China's case, that, this, that China today is exactly where Japan was in the 1970s in terms of its stage of economic development, or where Korea and Taiwan were subsequently in the 1980s and 1990s. And now these are the gold medalists of growth. These are countries that have gone on to successfully uh, industrialize themselves. But even these gold medalists of growth ended up slowing down at that sort of per capita income level. And I think that that's, to me, like something which is happening in China as we speak. And yet the uh, uh, anchoring bias is such that the moment you speak to people that China's economy may grow at less than 8%, there's a lot of nervousness out there. Because even the IMF projects that the next five years, China's growth rate will be uh, more than 8%. And you got uh, and the sort of uh, sociological game in town, which I find very worrying, is this thing about when China is going to overtake the U.S. That you know, like there are all sorts of arguments, you know, which are going on around there in terms of that. Uh, that will it be 2018? Will it be 2021? Uh, and they're all based on this straight line extrapolation: eight percent GDP growth, endless eight, like into the future, currency will appreciate a bit. So in dollar terms, it's only a matter of time that uh, that. China overtakes the uh, the U.S. economy, and this is completely ignoring the fact that we've gone through this entire period uh, in economic history, where often at this stage of economic development things get much tougher. Uh, I'm not even talking about the middle income trap, which is a separate concept and a much debated concept. I'm just talking about a middle income deceleration. But I think that the world is not prepared for some of this, especially some of the commodity exporting countries, because the commodity exporting countries now have again come to believe that we are in some sort of massive commodity super cycle. We are back to the, you know, like in these Malthusian arguments about how the world is running out of everything from oil to wheat to corn, uh, because demand is growing a lot, supply is not keeping pace. And yet, if you look at the 200 year history of commodities, it's a, it's a consistent pattern. One decade up, two decades down. And we've just had that one decade up. And the reason for this is that even though demand has increased continuously over time, the, the uh, human ingenuity in terms of innovation and other factors in terms of lowering the cost of extraction or, and other substitutes have brought down the cost of uh, production and therefore commodity prices over time. So in fact, even in our asset allocation mixes, I tell people that commodities historically are the worst performing asset class compared to stocks or bonds. This is the worst performing asset class, and it should be, because why should people sort of make too much money for essentially digging 
dirt out of the ground. And that's exactly what I think the commodity business is. And yet the sociological signs of excess are there. I was looking at this thing that a decade ago, the number of billionaires who came from the tech sector represented about one third of the total number of billionaires in the world. Today, the number of billionaires coming from the commodity sector are one third of the total billionaires in the world. Right? So this is a massive price move, which has inflated the fortunes and market capitalization of a lot of uh, uh, billionaires out there. So as I sort of go around this world in this, uh, in this economic travelogue, I try and come up with some rules of the road, because I think that the IMA, World Bank, and other sort of academics have done a pretty good job of coming up with, you know, like, the, uh, the, like all, the, all the academic stuff, which is in terms of that quality of institutions matter, education matters, and, and uh, rule of law matters. But sometimes you also need, uh, as investors, we pay a, a lot of attention to touchy-feely stuff. Like one thing that I come up in the book is something called a Four Seasons Index. And luckily, you know, when we get to travel the world, we get to stay in the Four Seasons hotels or in similar luxury hotels. And often when you look at the prices of these hotels, they tell you whether a country is competitive for doing business or not. And I find it shocking that when you get to like Brazil or Russia, you pay for high-end room rates there $1,000 a night. And, you know, like in places in like East Asia, which have, uh, you know, sort of figured the currency game out much better, whether it's China or whether it's Korea, or the likes of Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines, you pay about two to $300 a night for a similar hotel room and stuff. And, and to me, this is really what the entire problem in like Brazil is, that the currency has appreciated massively because of the commodity boom and the fact that their interest rates are relatively high, leading to a huge amount of capital, but the rest of the economy is getting hollowed out. So nobody is really producing much in Brazil. They're running a current account deficit, even though they, uh, they have a commodity boom to back them up. And I shudder to think what's going to happen to them if commodity prices fall, as I anticipate they will, in the coming few years. So I think that could, you know, that could be a serious problem for the likes of Brazil. Same thing for Russia. That Russia, when I used to go there like a decade ago, the price of oil was $25 a barrel. And they used to be paranoid that what if this falls to $15 a barrel? What will happen to us again? Because they just suffered from, what, uh, from that sort of experience in the, in the late 1990s. Today, Russia cannot balance its budget at an oil price on Brent of even $110 a barrel. So these things just get embedded, and, and, and that's, what the, uh, that's where the problems arise. And yet, uh, the countries that I feel a bit more optimistic are, are countries where I you know, still feel, or countries that I feel which are coming back from the abyss, or countries that are reforming because they had their back to the wall or they need to attract capital. You want to be with those countries. Like in one you know, sort of example, which I find that I get a lot of pushback from, is Philippines. Now, Philippines, as we know, used to be the star of Asia in the 1960s. It was the second richest country in Asia. And, and because of political and economic turmoil since, it, it was a constant laggard. You know? And this is the problem with long-term forecasting as well. The 1960s, the major institutions in the world said that the, that, that the next East Asian tigers would be Philippines, Burma, and Sri Lanka. And the ADB set up their office in Manila expecting that to happen. And, and so like we, we went through this entire period, but I, but I began to turn in Philippines because two years ago when I would go to Philippines, I would see there's a lot of sort of angst there in society that they have been passed by every single East Asian country in terms of their per capita income. And, and for them, the final nail in the coffin was when uh, Indonesia also surpassed them to be a richer country than, than they were. So I, and then you could f find out that they were trying to throw up a leader out there like who would be more focused on economic reform and in delivering an, uh, some sort of an investment cycle again. And that's what I, you know, makes me a bit more positive on Philippines. But what I try and sort of say here is that for me, the destination is more important, uh, is not as important as the journey. The journey is more important. You've got to figure out the rules of the road and you need to be flexible. You, you cannot get locked into views for too long. And the other thing which I have a lot of contempt for is long-term forecasting. You know, like, I mean, like I, as I say in the book, that the old rule of forecasting used to be that you make as many forecasts as possible and you remind people when you're right. To me, the new rule of forecasting now is that you, that you forecast so far out in the future that neither you nor I will know, you know whether we were right. <laughs> you know, so I, you know, like, for example, you know, like I hate to say that, I mean, other books are written about, about, about you know, what will happen to the world in 2030, what will happen to the world in 2050. I mean, who cares? Who's going to be around to sort of figure that out? And I'd love, you know, like, I think this is true for 
Like most of us who live in a practical world, which is that I wish I could find a client who tell me I'll come and check your performance in 2030. I wish, you know, like politicians would sort of, you know, say that, listen, you elect me in, in 2030 if I deliver till then. I mean, the world just doesn't work on those parameters. And, and this entire business, you know, like the, like these books, you know, which do well, which I find staggering that, you know, like why nations fail uh, because something happened in the year 1400 or something happened in the year 1500. So therefore that is a sort of good guide for us to tell us what will happen, you know, 20 years from now. You know, I mean, again, I mean, for me, no practical value. So what I've tried to do here is to try and sort of uh, keep the uh, horizon to a practical one, which I think is three to five years, maximum like a decade, and to be flexible about it. I think that's the problem with acronyms. I see some of my sort of uh, counterparts and other firms twisting and turning all the time, uh, trying to you know, like defend BRIC, uh, you know, because, and they'll defend Russia as to how, et cetera, like it should be, because they have to, they're wedded to an acronym now. And so it's very hard to drop one because it doesn't sound as cool anymore. So like, I mean, like you get you know, completely wedded into the, into the stuff. Whereas the whole concept of breakout nation, which I try and sort of put out here, is that is that you got to sort of figure out which countries are going to exceed expectations and which ones are will disappoint and be flexible about it. You know, have some rules of the road that as you travel the world, some of them can be easy rules like the Four Seasons Index. Some of them, you know, like involved uh, assessing as to which countries are willing, I mean, have their back to the wall and are willing to reform. Uh, some of them, you know, are like political rules, like one thing which I come up with, which, which is, I, I know, a bit of a controversial sort of argument with some of the, you know, like obviously uh, free thinking people haven't liked, but I've tried to be objective, is that it does not matter what's your economic system, which is that I looked at about all the high growth cases in the world over the past three decades and figured out that what was the political regime that was backing them? Was it an authoritarian one or a democratic one? And I found of the 124 high growth cases I looked at, it was 50-50. It just didn't matter as to what was the system backing it. So when someone you know, like, tells me starry-eyed about how good the Chinese model is because it's a command and control system, I said, yeah, but for every command and control system that works, I can show you one that does not. And the biggest disappointment in the last four to five years for me has been Vietnam. Uh, you know, which had, you know, which was sort of heralded as the next China of that region and had greatness thrust upon it prematurely. And yet uh, Vietnam, you know, tried to copy everything that China was doing and has, and has come up with results which are really disappointing from double digit inflation in, on a persistent <clears throat> basis and economic growth that is now falling very rapidly from the highs that they had three to four years ago. So what you need is flexibility. You need some sort of rules about, you know, what, what will work and what will not. And I think that's the like, concept of breakout nations. And the last you know, like, factor about breakout nations, which I think we need to pay uh, a lot of attention to, is expectations. I think expectations are really key. So, you know, some people ask me that, listen, you don't cite the, you know, China as a breakout nation or even India as a breakout nation, even though you, you expect the growth rates will be okay, which is that if India grows at five, you know, like 6%, it's still growing much faster than the Western world. Or if China grows at 6%, even that's much faster. But to me, if... India's growth rate, for example, has slowed down now to around 6%, and China's is now dipping below 8%. And the domestic mood in those countries is, is, is rather bleak. Not so much in China as yet, but definitely like in India. Like in India this morning, I was you know, watching a debate on television, and it was about the fact that is India, you know, like depression in India, question mark, because the growth rate is like slipping from the highs of 8 to 9%, and, and to this. So to me, expectations are key. That what makes a breakout nation is a country which is able to exceed expectations because that's what the politicians, the investors, the business community has come to expect. So if India grows at 5%, it may appear to be high, but for a country with a per capita income of only $1,500, that will feel like a mini depression back home. And I think the same thing with China, that China's economy, I think, has been a remarkable success. And the economy now is just maturing because it, it has grown like very quickly. One simple statistic here is that about 120 million Chinese move from rural to urban areas over the past decade. The urbanization ratio in China now has reached 50%. And that's typically when things begin to slow down. So the like number that you expect now to move from, urban to, uh, from rural to urban areas over the coming decade is a fraction of what happened over the previous decade. So things naturally slow down because of those factors. But I think that what people forget is the fact that uh, is that economies tend to sort of slow down naturally. And yet, when you ask even people in, like in my community, the question like often asked is, will China have a hard landing? 
And how do they define a hard landing? 7% growth or less. <laughs> so I think that's what's happened, that you know, the expectations get inflated. And then when you uh, disappoint those expectations, um, it feels as if uh, like it'll be a real problem. And I think that that's what's happened as far as emerging markets is concerned. And that's how like, I try and talk about it, that, uh, that a decade ago, if I had to sell emerging markets, a lot of my colleagues tried to do, in the midst of the tech boom here in the US, they had to um, re-crisis emerging markets as emerging markets to try and get some stardust from the US because nobody wanted to listen to that. <clears throat> By the middle of the decade, we were at a stage where every man and his dog could raise money for emerging markets. By the end of the decade, we were at a stage where just the dog would do. Mm -hmm. And I think that what's happening now is that we are once again reassessing ourselves and as capital flows have been slowing down to emerging markets, and that we have to now go back to distinguishing these emerging markets on an on an like individual basis. So when policymakers ask me that, you know, like what should we do? I'd say like like for me, the closing line in the book, and for me the mantra is that when there is no wind, row, which is that you just cannot <coughs> expect to sort of uh, converge with the developed world like you did over the past decade when money was really cheap and, and it was starting from a low base and catching up after the poor performance. Now each emerging market needs to reform and come up with their own sort of uh, agenda to try and catch up with the developed world.